You're watching Bread and Roses, a weekly political social magazine that's broadcast in English and Persian via New Channel TV. Hello everyone, I'm Maryam Namazi. And I'm Faribor Spuya. In this week's program, we'll be interviewing Ajanta Debroy, who is a Bangladeshi secularist and she's on deaf list of the Islamist. We'll also be talking about Rohani's visit to Europe uh, and a little something about wine as well as protests in Iran against uh, racism against the Turks and protests in Afghanistan uh, f against uh, various things which we tell you about in the program as well as a Shiro cafe of acid attack victims and survivors as well as a fatwa that isn't true but it's so funny we thought we'd bring it to you. Stay with us. Rouhani, the Iranian president, is on a tour to Europe and he's visiting Italy and France. And of course, there's a scandal already and it's, it's the fact that he, uh, the, the French government had to cancel their dinner for him because he didn't want any wine served nor any non-halal food served. So yeah. he, didn't, well, he didn't want any wine there. We'll, we'll have the wine and I think that's good on French government to cancel the... Uh, the, 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 the dinner for him, um, he shouldn't actually be welcomed. Why in. are they giving him a dinner? What? He should be in jail. He, sh he shouldn't actually welcome, he shouldn't be welcomed in, in, in Europe. Of course. Under his government, 2,000 people have been executed. And he is, was responsible for a lot of murder before he became um, prime minister, president. Know, president in Iran. And that's the thing. The f French and the European company, companies are tripping over each other to have these. I mean, you could see, you know, the, the, the economic interest is overtaking the human rights and the outrageous and fascist government that exists in Iran. Yeah. And I think that's just wrong. Well, I mean, I mean, it's definitely a visit about money and economics and how they are going to trade with Iran, how they're going to make money off of Iran. Again, this is really blood money. This is a regime that has killed so many people. How dare they offer him a dinner, first of all, and how dare they give him the red carpet treatment when there are so many people in Iran languishing in prison and you know, living under a theocracy in the 21st century. Now, again, if we're talking about some of the things that the regime has done, one of it is, of course, it's immense racism against various ethnicities in Iran, Arabs, Turks, you hear about this all the time. And the, the most recent scandal is, of course, um, two of the Iranian regime's programs have talked about Turks in a really derogatory manner. And this is a state-driven. In Iran, uh, the government and media is completely controlled by the Islamic government, so there's no sort of spontaneous thing. This is very well-designed um, attack on the Azari-speaking uh, uh, people in Iran and there's been protests everywhere and people are objected to that and I think uh, we need to recognize the Islamic and this regime always generates racism against various uh, ethnic groups uh, in, in uh, nationalities in Iran. Yeah, one of the poles of an Islamic regime is, of course, misogyny against women. Another very important pole of this government and this movement is racism. racism. Yeah, definitely. And going to talking about protests, there was some wonderful protests in Kabul uh, against the stoning of Rakhshana. Yeah. Um, you know, wonderful banners and logos. One of them uh, said, you know, um, it said we should cut off the hands, the filthy hands of the merchants of religion uh, so that we will not have to every day be witness to the case, uh, far, many Farkhondes and many Rukhshanas in Afghanistan. Absolutely. And this is again, you could see the role of state, uh, Afghanistan, uh, Afghanistan state here. Um, when you listen to the debate within the uh, parliament, so-called parliament in Afghanistan, you could see actually they are in agreement with the stoning. They're just saying, look, you need to manage this. That's what it is. But the reality is that people of Afghanistan are sick and tired of Sharia law, Islamic uh, government, and really they don't want this. And this is just uh, perpetrated by the state and Islamists who've taken over all institutions in Afghanistan. No, but the, 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 the 
the biggest irony is the fact that, you know, after Rokhshana's uh, stoning, the government has sent, and uh, they've called it, the president has called it heinous, a heinous act, and he sent a commission to investigate. Now, one of the people in this co delegation, this who's presidential actually, delegation, who's heading the delegation, is he's uh, with, within the National Ulama Council, and he believes that there is nothing wrong with stoning. He is supportive of stoning. He thinks stoning should take place, but he just wants to make sure that it was done properly. Yeah. Now, this is added outrage. You know, the Taliban stones, the, the, the government of Afghanistan continues defending stoning and sends delegates that actually condone stoning. Right. It's outrageous. And that's the thing. States in Middle East, the Islamists Islamists have power, they're actually part and parcel of a problem. What do you do in these situations? Yeah. Well, I think, we, you know, we have to put so much pressure on the Afghan government uh, because it's not just the Taliban that is condoning and doing these acts. Uh, very often you find that there are people within the government, the government itself, that supports it. So putting immense pressure on the Afghan government, you know, we have to say that Rokhshana is going to be the last woman stoned, f full stop, the last woman stoned. The insane fatwa of uh, the week is from Sheikh Abdul Aziz bin Abdullah, a mufti in Saudi Arabia. It's been all over the news that he has issued a fatwa which has come out to be not true. And so we're telling you this in case you're, you know, waiting to eat your wives because, um, you know, one of the fatwas that he is supposedly have given is that if a man is starving, he should be able to eat his wife because, you know, he owns his wife. Or oh, there are certain circumstances that is justifiable. And, uh, uh, yes, tell us the, cir the circumstances. Yeah, that yeah. Is, you're desperate, you have yeah. no food, you, you can do that. You eat your wife. <laughs> According yeah. to him. Yeah. Um, well, we, we, we just want to warn viewers who are waiting with their knives and forks, you know, to dig into their wives. It's not true. It's not it's true. true. So you, you, Don't you, do you're going to need to stop now. I think, yeah. I, I think, I think the issue is that uh, you can't actually, he went through the whole uh, sort of social media. A lot of people started talking about it. Because you actually can't, you don't put this beyond the slum. It's possible exactly, that they do that. Yeah. When we investigated, he said that he hasn't said it. And... Um, I don't so, believe him. Yeah, so, we <laughs> <laughs> so we don't have uh, really a proper fat for this week. So hold off on eating your wife's. Until next week. I'm sure there will one be will come another up. one come up next week. And then dig in. <laughs> I don't know if you've heard about this wonderful cafe near the Taj Mahal in Agra. It's called Shiro's Cafe and it's oh, Shiro's Hangout. And it's basically something that was set up by a crowdfunding where uh, survivors of acid attacks have come together and set up this cafe. And it's a wonderful place where you can go have a coffee, have some delicious food and also meet women who have survived acid attacks and are in a way, fighting back. No, absolutely. And society accepting uh, the group who actually are actually physically deformed because the acid attack is a phenomenon in, uh, in Middle East. In Iran last year, we had a major uh, state-sponsored acid attack in, the, um, in Esfahan and a number of other uh, Against cities. women who are not properly, va properly veiled. And there was huge demonstrations. Um, but they, sometimes it's an uh, um, issue of people sort of, once they are physically deformed, they hide away. They don't, they're not seen in public and public doesn't accept them. But they've actually they've, they've come out in, as you know, in, in, in the society and have formed a, a cafe. And it's brilliant. And they, they, they're so successful and they're supported everywhere. And if you inc incidentally go and visit Taj Mahal, make sure you, you go and visit the uh, Shira's uh, hangout. Yeah, it says it's it's uh, it's women who have dealt with the pain of a charred face and a scarred soul. Really inspirational stuff. We'll now watch an interview I did recently with Ajanta Deb Roy. She's a Bangladeshi secularist who is on an Islamist death list. She'll be talking about 
the situation of free thinkers in Bangladesh as well as what she and others are doing to resist the situation. Stay with us. Welcome Ajanta. I wanted to ask you about the situation in Bangladesh, particularly for free thinkers. Thank you so much for inviting me here today. And um, yeah, the situation in Bangladesh is uh, like well publicized internationally. So you know already what's been happening in Bangladesh for the last seven months. There's already sev five killings in seven months and three more are critically injured. So the situation is really, really worrying right now. Yeah. And what, you know, what's surprising, I think, or very, you know, angers a lot of people is the fact that the government isn't really doing anything and also sometimes making excuses. Yeah, you were right. Actually, the thing is when the first murder happened of Vijit Roy, we expected the government to take action rapidly because he was a very well-known writer and his father is a well-known professor in Dhaka University. He is a well-known writer as well. But surprising, the Prime Minister, she called uh, Ojur Rayovic's father, but secretly, because they didn't want to publish it to the media or they didn't want anyone to know that the Prime Minister actually showed sympathy to an atheist father. Um, and the government is playing the religion card to keep those, you know, it, it's, it's like they're, they're repeatedly making concessions with those fundamentalist uh, extremists because they know that they, there are like a huge number of people there, they are in, taking the side of those extremists because of the religion card they, that they are playing. And um, more surprisingly, the Prime Minister's son, she sa he already clearly said that they cannot take a direct stand for these killings of the free thinkers. And also the recent murder that happened of publishers, um, Deepon, he, he was killed. He was one of the publisher who published Obijit Roy's book. And the Home Minister, he said, it, it, this is an isolated incident and it, this kind of situation and this kind of murders is happening in all over the world. That means he's not, uh, either he's not giving importance to this sort of killings, otherwise he's just denying it, just to, um, you know, ju just to show that, just to deny the responsibility that he has failed. He doesn't want to accept the failings in that matter. So this, this situation is really worrying because the government has completely failed to address, even to address the situation because no one from the government, Prime Minister, Home Minister, or no one from the government has given any speech yet that can comfort us that they are taking this matter seriously. And also the police, they're show, not showing any... Um, any actions. Even a police officer got killed the same way. They didn't even shoot the killers. They, one officer got killed three, four, they ran away and they didn't, they had the gun with them, but they didn't shoot anybody. So this, this kind of situation, and only um, after the killings, the, or they ordered that, okay, you can shoot the killers if somebody attack you. I don't know why they didn't do it before. So this, it, it seems this like, is upsetting. It, especially also, in fact, the more concessions you give to Islamists, the more they take. So the more violence there will be, the more killing there will be. It's like a vicious circle, isn't it? Exactly, because the more you show that you are actually uh, making concessions to the killers or to the religious fundamentalists, and you're showing that, okay, uh, after every killing, what they're saying, okay, we condemn the killing, but you should not write this 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 these things then they are like uh, like creating limit uh, boundaries for the writers they are trying to in indirectly like justify the killings that you are getting killed because you're writing so these kind of things are in indirectly uh, actually um, how can I say that actually uh, motivating or you know, encouraging. encouraging the killers to do it, that they can get away with the killings. Um, I, I want to mention that, you know, Rajib Haider Shobhan, the first blogger who got killed after Shabak started, his murder case just started moving this year, it's after two years, you know, and also uh, Washikur Babu's killers got arrested by the people nearby, but he, there's nothing, no trial started yet. So it's like, they are making concessions, they're not doing, um, you know, the, the cases are not taken seriously. It has to be done by, you know, um, quick trials. That demand was that you have to bring them uh, under justice and under quick investigation and quick trial, but they're not doing any sort of things and they're 
um, you know, it, it's like the rela most relaxed approach in addressing the bloggers' killings and also in taking actions. I mean, and it's also not just a question issue for people in Bangladesh. There's a lot of uh, Bangladeshis here in Britain as well who are concerned and feel threatened. Tell us, and I think you're one of those people as well, tell us a bit about what's happened around that. Actually, um, how can I say this? There are like so many things. It's happening um, since 2013. It's nothing new. Um, since Shabak started, we started our movement um, like aligned with the movement back home. It was a movement uh, against the war criminals of 1971 and the Jamaat-e-Islami, the uh, fundamentalist, religious fundamentalist group of Bangladesh who uh, opposed our liberation in 1971 and who were still doing anti-liberation activities and spreading fundamentalism, religious violence, and uh, who and who we think are behind all those extremists and all the organizations. They're like the um, parent organization of all extremist uh, Islamic extremist organization that's what we believe so since it started we started our um, like our movement here but surprisingly there was no attack like in Bangladesh they were doing the protest in peace while the police were giving them protection and and the police were there and nothing happened in first one week but we got attacked the very first day in Altabali Park on 8th February they were like, uh, police were there, but they didn't do anything because uh, they were like the Jamaat-e Islami, local Jamaat-e Islami and their, their supporters were there on the uh, park on that day, on 8th February. From our side, there were like children, there were women, of women, people from different ages. We were there. And on the other side, there were like only men with um, uh, like two piece, like head covers and like strong men from... And they were like throwing abuses at us openly. They were throwing eggs, they were throwing sto stones, water bottles, cans. Police, did, we, I, I went as an organizer, I went repeatedly to ask the police for help. They were saying, no, it's, it's happening from both sides. They didn't want to address that it's happening. And what happened after the protest broke, when we were coming up out of Altabali Park, we actually got physically attacked in front of police, like about eight of our activists were attacked. They punched on the face, they kicked our protesters, they were chasing one or two of them through Brick Lane. But, you know, there was no investigation, no one were, was arrested, nothing happened. And since then, I was getting threats. There was a hit list um, in 2013 uh, of 10 UK activists and bloggers and writers. Uh, like and on that I was the only woman named on that hit list. I went to police several times and I demanded an investigation. I even had a meeting with the Met Police High Commander. They assured me that they're going to look into this matter seriously. But I found out very recently that my case was closed within two months. This year again, once that these killings started, uh, like what happened? It's it's very. Dis disturbing that I couldn't go home in the last two years because of these threats because I know that if I go home I'll be attacked and things won't be like Ab like Abhijit he couldn't survive for two weeks he was murdered after Abhijit's murder there was another hit list from the UK of 10 activists I went like that that this time the somebody from Scotland here counter intelligence officer they contacted me that your name is there are you aware of that or not they only, I, I requested a panic alarm that I, I need a panic alarm to give me. They came to my house and they checked the security and all that. They only sent me a safeguarding instruction, but they closed my case. They didn't do any investigation. After that, there was another global hit list that came out and it was well advertised internationally. It was in Guardian, BBC, CNN, just you name it, you know, it was everywhere. I went to the police to show them that, you know, this is a hit list from Ansarullah who's, who's on a killing spree back in Bangladesh. So, and I gave them the Facebook link from where I got it. I gave them the screenshot, everything. But like the officer there was not helpful at all. They were like showing, okay, it can happen because you have a different political opinion and all. They took it seriously. They showed that, okay, we will do something. We'll let you know. After one or two weeks, they sent me an email that they're closing the case. 
Did, didn't they say something like, um, well, ac uh, activists should expect getting um, these they, sorts they of problems? They say that later on. What happened afterwards uh, is more, even more interesting. I was, and then one newspaper in Bangladesh, it's a national newspaper, they started, um, they, they published the news with my name and another fellow activist name. Her name was also there on the global hit list. And then they did, um, they publicized that we are doing some international activities from here and uh, uh, Australia cricket team, they canceled their tour to Bangladesh because of me and I'm the one responsible for it. And they posted my, they stole my picture from Twitter and they posted on the national newspaper, it was a like headline newspaper with red ink. And then I and it went virally online and people were posting abusive words, swearing at me, sexual threats and all. And I, I didn't know what to do. I was so scared about the safety of my family back home. And one morning, the, the police officer, uh, like the IGP of police of Bangladesh, she's like the um, additional IG of police of Bangladesh. He, on a television talk show, in a national television, he was saying the same thing, that me, uh, my other colleague, and somebody from Israel is plotting against Bangladesh and doing, you know, uh, these things. And what did the police say to you when they heard all of this as well? I, yeah, actually, what happened, I, I, I confronted the IGP on live, on live TV and he backed down a little bit and he was... But when I went to the police here, I this time I took Gita Shagel with me because she knows my case from 2013. So I thought, okay, they're not taking me seriously. So let me take somebody who you know, who is well known and they will take it seriously again. I took her with me, the, the police officer there, she was like, there was a barrier there. They were not even, you know, barrier between me and her, but she still wrote the case and I told her everything. I showed her the case and everything. After two, three days, somebody called me from the police station and he was telling me, uh, you know, uh, unfortunately, we are going to close your case again because, you know, I, I actually complained with Gita. I actually complained to them. You know, I want to complain because I'm, be, I'm coming to you. You know my face because this is the same police station that I'm going. You know my face. My, like, whenever I come to you, you start saying, hello, how are you now? Like, that means you know me, my case. But you are still closing my cases without doing any investigation. And you were saying that you don't have any... Um, evidence or anything to do it but well i'm providing you with evidence so the police officer who called me he said um you know we are closing your case because we don't have any uh, anything to go on with go on with the investigation and we have provided you with the safeguarding instruction i think that should be enough and we don't think we are you are under threat i was like you don't think i'm under threat i'm getting these are the abusers i'm that he's like if you were an activist this is uh, normal if you were in politics this is normal people will have different opinion against you and they will say it um, and if you don't like it come out of online why do you go and see it well, it's outrageous, sort of blaming you again for exactly. the threats. Um, what can people do both against the Bangladeshi government, which has to be held responsible, as well as to get the police to do something here? What What are your suggestions? What can people do? Actually, um, from last few months, what we are expecting, like whoever we are in outside Bangladesh, like me, Bonna, Davijit's wife, and like other uh, other activists and everyone. What I can see everywhere, we are trying to get international community involved and trying to create a pressure on our government so that they take immediate action against those killers and at least address the situation that this is a situation that we have to deal with. What our government is doing, they are not even addressing that there is a problem. To deal with a problem, you have to address it. They're not addressing the problem. They're even they're trying to mark it as an as isolated incident, and they're not. Um, we don't see enough arrests. We don't see the whoever got arrested. Not the the trial hasn't started yet. So, we want the community to come forward. Whoever are working with the bloggers' issues and the free thinking issues, because this this is a very serious matter. It's not only. Uh, Bangladesh issue now it's it's like an international issue and all like all over the world it it will affect you maybe today it's Bangladesh tomorrow it can be UK because I, I received a threat uh, very recently from somebody in Facebook and that person had a profile it's like somebody a supporter of ISIS 
and um, had like fif around 1500 friends who had like something uh, ISIS flags profiles and everything. I sent it to the police, but I haven't received any reply from them yet. So, so it is a serious issue, I think. Yeah, I mean, it is, as you say, this is all our fights and we have to uh, show yeah. a solidarity and make sure action is taken. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed the interview with Ajanta Debroy. I think she raises so many important questions and I think it's really good to get a personal you know, testimony and statement about what, what is happening to so many people in that country. It is, there is really a war on free thinkers in that country, but there is also an immense fight back. And Ajanta really represents that, that sort of fight back. Absolutely. And one of the th uh, key points that she raises is a state uh, and Bangladeshi government complicity with Islamists. I think that that's the, uh, one of the important issues. You always have the state part and parcel of this. You know, Bangladeshi government has a formal responsibility to stop these, to arrest these. They're not doing anything about it. And that's why not only the world needs to be outraged and put pressure on the Bangladeshi government, but people, you know, you think, what else can you do? People need to start organizing self-defenses in Bangladesh against this. I mean, is this one of the solutions that people have to, eventually, if the Bangladeshi government doesn't sort of do anything about it that seems to be the only solution that people have. but also i mean there's an issue of how uh, you know uh, european governments are addressing this issue for example of uh, bangladeshis who are on death lists who live in europe for example we've got uk-based bangladeshis yeah. who are on death lists and of course the police is really not taking any action i mean ajanta was told well you know activists can you know expect to get such things because that's why they're activists and if you don't like it then stop being active again always blaming the victim rather than actually putting your finger and pointing at the aggressors absolutely and this is exactly what the uh, Bangladeshi government is saying to exactly. people so if you don't no like different. it do not write do yeah. not oppose the Islamists yeah. that's not acceptable the fight back is happening and this program is supporting the uh, Bangladeshi atheists and secularists and condemning the uh, the act activities of the Islamists in Bangladesh. Yeah. Anyway, we've reached the end of our program. We hope you enjoyed this week's programs, the issues that we discussed. We look forward to always hearing from you. Do keep in touch. Do keep supporting us via Patreon and other ways. Uh, we, we really um, get so happy when we get feedback, whether it's on our YouTube channel um, and, of course, uh, from viewers in Iran. Anyway, I uh, hope you have a lovely week and until next week. From me and Mariam Namazi. Bye. Goodbye. Hi, I'm Mariam Namazi. And I'm Fadi Bospuya. We're hosting a program called Bread and Roses. It's a weekly program that's broadcast in Persian and English in the Middle East and North Africa, primarily Iran as well. And it's also shown on YouTube internationally. And we've been doing this since last May. We're coming up to our year's anniversary. And yeah. we, we've had quite a lot of fun making these videos. We discuss taboo breaking, free thinking ideas. The Islamic regime of Iran has called us immoral and corrupt and that's why the, you need to support us we are and the vo alternative voice in Middle East and North Africa of corruption and immorality so do support us here's a short video from patreon that explains how you can help us with even just one dollar a week that's nothing support us patreon lets fans become patrons of their favorite artists and content creators it's different than Kickstarter because it's not about one big project that requires lots of funding. It's more for bloggers or YouTubers or webcomics, anyone who creates on a regular basis. Here's how it works. When you become a patron, you're agreeing to give an artist a tip of an amount you set every time they release a piece of content, whether it's a new song, a video, or a recipe. 
You can set a monthly maximum to make sure that you're always within your budget. Choose an amount, enter your payment information, and you're done. Becoming a patron allows you to view and post in the artist's stream. And in exchange for your support, artists offer additional patron packages, which might include monthly Google Hangouts, music production tutorials, pre-sale concert tickets, or anything they can offer as a way to say thanks. Patreon, empowering a new generation of content creators.